here's the here's the plan for the rest of the semester so that you don't think I'm totally unreasonable. All right. The plan is this. And I guess I will need to check on the availability of the lab to see um, how this will go. Um, but but I can do that later today. There was someone in there now, but it kind of looked like they were breaking up. So um, we can check on the availability of the lab. What I plan to do is I have a few things that I really feel I have to cover. All right, that that it, it wouldn't be complete if we didn't cover them, and I would expect that to take between today and maybe all done today, maybe done on Wednesday, or no, Thursday, all right? Um, I would then like to have the remainder of the time just an open time for you to work on your stuff, all right? And I say this for a couple of reasons. First of all, you in your project might have some piece of functionality that isn't necessarily relevant to the rest of the class, but maybe is really critical for yours, for example. So, you know, it's tough to cover everything, and I don't necessarily want to have people, you know, listening through a discussion of something that isn't really relevant to their project. Um, if I cover these three, three or four things, whatever they are, then I'll be pretty, pretty happy um, with what we've covered as far as lecture goes, and then the rest will be more of, of an individual basis of what you're having problems with and, and what you need assistance with, whether it be something that we've covered or um, maybe something that we haven't covered that, that's required for your project. So let me give an overview of the stuff that we're going to talk about. I think actually it will come down to Maybe, maybe four topics, but a couple of them are pretty, pretty short. Number one, a review, a very quick review, maybe just some thoughts regarding updating grid and detail views. I believe this is stuff that we have talked about before, but, you know, it bears repeating. So that's, that's one of them. Second thing. Your own sequel. Or how do I want to call this? SQL without using details view or grid view. Sort of a roll your own kind of thing. All right, if you don't want to use SQL that's tied to a grid view or a details view. But maybe you want to insert something in a table that there is no details view or grid view. All right? Maybe you want to log in a table when someone visits a certain page. All right? There's no form to fill out. You just want to go and write some code that's going to go and do an update to a database or, or uh, an insert into a table or whatever. The third thing is session variables. So I guess there are three things. So, this is probably the biggest, this is the Goldilocks topic, <laughs> and this one's the smallest. All right, <clears throat> topic number one, thoughts regarding updating grid and detail views. All right, first of all. These are, uh, how do I want to say it? These are my suggestions about how to make your life easier, all right? Contrary to, you know, my 
apparent grouchiness before clients. My job is not interested in making your life tough, but in making your life easier. So, tips to make your life easier if you're updating grid and detail views. Number one, only one table. All right. So, for example, in your automobile application that you're working on, you probably have something like a car maintenance table or a car procedure table where you have car information, the primary key of the car, and the procedure code, and the date, and all that. All right. Or for that matter, the automobile. Let's talk about that one, the automobile. There's the automobile that might be joined to a make and a model table. All right. Uh, fair enough. You might think you need all of those fields in your detail view to show the um, information about the car, the information about the make, the information about the model, and so on. You don't need that. All right. What you can do is you can make your details view, and the same thing applies to a grid view, only use one table, and then you'll have something like this, probably. You'll have a, you know, car ID, VIN number, maybe a branch ID, maybe a model ID, all right? And you might say, I don't want to see the branch ID. I don't know what branch 67 is. I don't want to see the model ID. I don't know what model 12 is. All right? That's where you go and you use template columns instead. So what you can do is you can make it for one table. So even if you want to show data from other tables, because it's not user friendly to show ID numbers, because no one knows what those ID numbers mean. You don't join to those other tables, though. You write your select statement to only pull from the one table, from the automobile table. You then use dropdowns. You then create a template column and use dropdowns to create a dropdown that will show you the branch information, let's say. and the model information. Okay. So, if you do that, your life will be easier. Question? Okay, are you talking about uh, the data source should just be one table and the details for you? Well, yeah, they go, they, they go hand in hand, right? So, yeah, you'd make the data source only have the one table, and then when you bind it to the details view or a grid view, those only have one table as well. And you'd use a template column then to bring other data from other tables in. All right, by making a drop down or, or whatever. So then you have to have the data source. Another data source. Yeah, you'd have to have another data source for the drop downs. Right. All right. <clears throat> That's suggestion one. Suggestion two is it is very difficult to update the keys to the table. All right. So don't try to update the keys. Now, this gets back to the discussion what if you do want to update the key? Or, or one of the keys, or maybe maybe there's multiple keys in a table. All right, that's where using a surrogate key or an auto number key comes in real handy because you don't have to worry about that because it's just an arbitrary number. No one cares if it's 53 or 54. Right? There's no need ever to change that. So therefore, it's best not to do that. All right. Not to, to, to change a primary key field. Instead, again, if you use a surrogate key, 
It's okay if you don't change it. There's really no need to change it. And then you can change all the other fields. So that's my advice on details view and grid views, especially when it comes to updating them. Can you do it otherwise? Can you do it, not follow this advice and, and do it? Yeah, you probably can. Um, it would involve then <coughs> a little more configuration uh, of the um, details view and, uh, uh, and of the uh, data source. You'd have to supply update parameters. Um, if you ever look in the code for something, you'll see select parameters. For example, and, and when, when we pull up an example in a minute here, we'll, we'll look at that. But there is a um, um, there is a uh, uh, a section associated with select parameters where you tie, for example, the question mark in your select statement to the query string or to a form uh, element or whatever. Um, you can do a comparable thing with update, insert, and delete parameters. All right, so you can do it that way if if you absolutely would have to bring in multiple tables. You can create the update parameters and just do a little bit more configuration. And if anyone really needs to do that, then um, you know, let me know. All right. So that's number one. Probably, quite, unless you have some immediate questions, probably questions associated with number one will be best shaken out in lab. All right, so we'll, we can talk about them then. All right, on to point number two. See, uh, roll your own SQL. All right, SQL without using the details view or grid view or programmatically creating your own SQL. There's a lot of occasions to do that, all right? Let's think of some of the occasions that you might want to do that, all right? One is, what about a login, all right? What about a login? With a login, you're not really, like, adding anything to the database, right? You're putting in a username and a password, and you're checking to see if that's a valid user. And... If it's a valid user, okay, they're logged in. If they're not a valid user, well, you display an error message. So if you think about it, that doesn't really fit the pattern of anything that we've done so far. All right? Everything we've done so far has been, that that's, that's associated uh, SQL and forms has been, um, you know, has had a visual component. In other words, we have a form to enter data into this table. Or we have, a, we have a grid view to display data. We're not displaying any data with a login, right? We are simply allowing the user to put in their user ID and password and then taking different actions based on whether it's a valid user ID or not. It's not as though we're displaying the user ID and password if they're successful or if they're uh, unsuccessful. We're just taking different actions. Another thing is, let's say, for example, anyone uh, belong to Netflix here? All right, good. With Netflix, you have a queue where you, you, you log in, all right? It remembers who you are, and then there's just a button on the page that says add to queue. All right, add to queue. And I think, by default, it puts it at the end of the queue. So it makes it the last. It's a list of the movies that you're going to get shipped to you. So I, I think by default it puts you at the end. Yes. Thank you. All right. Now, if you think about that, that form is very simplistic, right? All there is is a button. All right? It would look something like this, the form, if you were going to see it. I've logged in. So up here it says, welcome Mike Zellers. All right. I then have 
and I'm looking at a movie. Star Wars. Episode 4, A New Hope. And there's a button that says Add to Queue. <coughs>
right? The position in the queue is calculated. All right. So in other words, it, it you know it automatically figures out based on how many rows you you already have what position to make. All right. Any questions about kind of what's going on here? Not necessarily how to do it because we haven't touched on how to do it yet. But any ideas on this? Let's go and let's create a few tables here. All right, let's create a little sample database and let's try to make our add to queue form that only has a button. All right, we'll make a bare bones. We're not going to be dazzling and, and all that. So we'll make some very simple tables. I'll make a user table. A movie table and a queue table. All right. So we have something like this, and we're ready to go. We're going to have to fake the login for now, but that's okay. We'll come back to do the login when we do our step three. So right now, we're just going to pretend that it's user one. This is Netflix for one. Only one customer allowed. <laughs> All right? I never said that business plans were my, my strong point. Right? So there's only one Netflix queue for the one user, so everyone gets to see the same movies. <laughs> All right. So let's go and let's create these tables. And... By the way, what I'm doing here of sort of faking part of this is pretty common in software development. Remember, everything has to work, but everything doesn't have to work immediately. So in the old days, we called them stub functions, where you might not know or you might not have written maybe part of the code yet. For example, if you're doing a payroll calculation, um, the calculation of, of federal withholding is really complicated, right, how much you, you withhold. Well, if you're, if you're writing this application, you may not be ready to tackle that big task yet. Or maybe even that task is assigned to someone else, all right? Um, I worked on an application that involves shipping overseas. You talk about complicated. There's so much regulation and this, that, and the other, all right? What did we do? We faked the function. We just put in, all right, cost 50 bucks to ship something overseas, all right? Now, to be sure, we couldn't release our product like that. We had to get the real function in there to do that calculation. But at least then I could continue developing my pieces of it while the guy who was doing the shipping calculation was working out all the, all the details. That really was... That would actually be an interesting case study because such a high amount of time was spent doing that international shipping calculation that it might have been better off just saying, if you want to ship something overseas, call one of our sales reps instead of spending all that time developing software that works for shipping stuff all over the world. And if you can imagine... Uh, the stuff that was being shipped, shipped was like laboratory chemicals, all right? And this was pre-9-11, all right? So, and the regulations then were tight. You know, certain chemicals you could only ship to certain places and blah, blah, blah. Now I imagine it's probably a lot crazier than that. So, again, you have to sort of balance the... I guess the lesson of this, this particular case is you have to balance sort of what's technically feasible with what's practical to do. Yeah, we can write a, we can write a, a shipping module that does all these calculations, but it took a third of the project's budget to do that. All right? Is that really the best way to go? How many foreign shipments do you really have? Are we doing all this work and spending a third of our money for something that's used five times a year? <laughs> You know, so anyhow, I digress. Let's go in and let's create our little database here.
real quick and I'll add a user table that just contains a user ID and a username. I will create a movie table that only contains a movie ID and a title. And I will create a queue table that contains a user ID, not going to be an auto number, just be a plain old number, and a movie ID. and the position in the queue. And I'll make these two the primary key. All right. So let's go in and just enter a couple of pieces of data. As we said, we are going to have one user, me. And we will have We'll do this very simplistically, then we, we could add bells and whistles if we wanted to. For example, a warning message if anyone requests Star Wars 1, <laughs> or 2 for that matter. And the queue table we're going to build. All right? So we're not going to put anything in that table. All right? Now, this is, again, an example. And, and how do I want to put this? In designing this and in talking through how I want it to be, all right, this deviates from the model of the way the framework normally does these things. That's okay, right? Don't be disturbed by the fact that, hey, you want to do things different than the model is. You're still a programmer. You can still take the bull by the horns and code this stuff yourself. So anytime you have a case where what you're doing doesn't really seem to fit the framework very well, fine. Don't use the framework for that piece of it. If there's other pieces of your project that do fit the framework well, then use it for that. So it's, again, it's sort of a judgment call that you make. Is it going to be harder to tweak the framework to do what I want to do, or is it easier just to do it yourself? All right, that's kind of the call that you have to make. So let's go and create my application, my web application. <coughs> 